Chapter Four of the Silent Barrier. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mary Herndon Bell. The Silent Barrier by Louis Tracy. Chapter Four: How Helen Came to Maloya. At Qua or Chur, as the three-tongued Swiss often term it, German being the language most in vogue in Switzerland, Helen found a cheerful-looking mountain train awaiting the coming of its heavy brother from far-off Calais. It was soon packed to the doors, for those alpine valleys hum with life and movement during the closing days of July. Even in the first-class carriages, nearly every seat was filled in a few minutes, while pandemonium reigned in the cheaper sections. Helen, having no cumbersome baggage to impede her movements, was swept in on the crest of the earliest wave, and obtained a corner near the corridor. She meant to leave her handbag there, stroll up and down the station for a few minutes, mainly to look at the cosmopolitan crowd, and perhaps buy some fruit. But the babble of English, German, French, and Italian, mixed with scraps of Russian and Czech, that raged round a distracted conductor, warned her that the wiser policy was to sit still. An Englishwoman, red-faced, elderly, and important, was offered a center seat facing the engine in Helen's compartment. She refused it. Her indignation was magnificent. To face the engine, she declared, meant instant illness. I never return to this wretched country that I do not regret it, she shrilled. Have you no telegraphs? Cannot your officials ascertain from Zurich how many English passengers may be expected, and make suitable provision for them? As this tirade was thrown away on the conductor, she proceeded to translate it into fairly accurate French, but the man was at his wit's end to accommodate the throng, and said so with the breathless politeness that such a grand dame seemed to merit. "'Then you should set apart a special train for passengers from England,' she declared vehemently. "'I shall never come here again, never! "'The place is overrun with cheap tourists. "'Moreover, I shall tell all my friends to avoid Switzerland. "'Perhaps when British patronage is withdrawn from your railways and hotels, "'you will begin to consider our requirements.' Helen felt that her irate fellow countrywoman was metaphorically hurling large volumes of the peerage, baronetage, and landed gentry at the unhappy conductor's head. Again he pointed out that there was a seat at Madame's service. When the train started, he would do his best to secure another in the desired position. As the woman, whose proportions were generous, was blocking the gangway, she received a forcible reminder from the end of a heavy portmanteau that she must clear out of the way. Breathing dire reprisals on the Swiss Federal Railway system, she entered unwillingly. Disgraceful, she snorted. A nation of boors. In another second, I should have been thrown down and trampled on. A stolid German and his wife occupied opposite corners, and the man probably wondered why the Englisher Frau glared at him so fiercely, but he did not move. Helen, thinking to throw oil on the troubled waters, said pleasantly, "'Won't you change seats with me? I don't mind whether I face the engine or not. In any case, I intend to stand in the corridor most of the time.' The stout woman, hearing herself addressed in English, lifted her mounted eyeglasses and stared at Helen. In one sweeping glance she took in details. As it happened, the girl had expended fifteen of her forty pounds on a neat tailor-made costume, a smart hat, well-fitting gloves, and the best pair of walking boots she could buy. For having pretty feet, it was a pardonable vanity that she should wish them well shod. Apparently the other was satisfied that there would be no loss of caste in accepted the proffered civility. Thank you. "'I am very much obliged,' she said. "'It is awfully sweet of you to incommode yourself for my sake.' It was difficult to believe that the woman who had just stormed at the conductor, who had the effrontery to subject Helen to that stony scrutiny before she answered, could adopt such dulcet tones so suddenly. Helen, frank and generous-minded to a degree, 
would have preferred a gradual subsidence of wrath to this remarkable volte face but she reiterated that she regarded her place in a carriage as of slight consequence and the change was effected the other adjusted her eyeglasses again and passed in review the remaining occupants of the compartment they were foreigners whose existence might be ignored this line grows worse each year she remarked by way of a conversational opening it is horrid travelling alone unfortunately i missed my son at lucerne are your people on the train no i too am alone ah going to st moritz yes but i take the diligence there for maloya the diligence who in the world advised that nobody ever travels that way by nobody she clearly conveyed the idea that she mixed in the sacred circle of somebody's carriage folk to the soles of their boots because helen's guide-book showed that a diligence ran twice daily through the upper engadine and the swiss authorities would not provide those capacious four-horsed vehicles unless there were passengers to fill them oh cried helen should i have ordered a carriage beforehand most decidedly but your friends will send one they know you are coming by this train helen smiled she anticipated a certain amount of cross-examination at the hands of residents in the hotel but she saw no reason why the ordeal should begin so soon i must take my luck then she said there ought to be plenty of carriages at st moritz without being positively rude her new acquaintance could not repeat the question thus shirked but she had other shafts in her quiver you will stay at the Cursal, of course she said yes a passing visit or for a period i ask because i am going there myself oh how nice i am glad i have met you i mean to remain at maloya until the end of august quite the right time the rest of switzerland is unbearable in august you will find the hotel rather full the burnham joneses are there the tennis players you know the general and mrs wragg and their family and the de la vers nominally husband and wife a most charming couple individually have you met the de la vers no well don't be unhappy on edith's account if reginald flirts with you she likes it but perhaps i might not like it laughed helen ah reginald has such fascinating manners a sigh seemed to deplore the days of long ago when reginald's fascination might have displayed itself on her account again there was a break in the flow of the talk and helen began to take an interest in the scenery not to be balked her inquisitor searched in a porte-monnaie attached to her left wrist with a strap and produced a card we may as well know each other's names she cooed affably here is my card helen read mrs h de courcy vavasour villa menini nice i am sorry she said with a friendly smile that might have disarmed prejudice but in the hurry of my departure from london i packed my cards in my registered baggage my name is helen winton the eyeglasses went up once more do you spell it with an i are you one of the gloucestershire wintons no i live in town but my home is in norfolk and whose party will you join at the maloya helen colored a little under this rigorous heckling as i have already told you mrs vavasour i am alone she said indeed i have come here to to do some literary work for a newspaper yes mrs vavasour received this statement guardedly if helen was on the staff of an important journal there was something to be gained by being cited in her articles as one of the important persons sojourning in the engadine it is really wonderful she admitted how enterprising the great daily papers are nowadays helen very new to the world of the de courcy's vavasours and rags and burnham joneses forgave this hawk-like pertinacity for sake of the apparent sympathy of her catechist 
and she was painfully candid. The weekly paper I represent is not at all well known, she explained, but here I am, and I mean to enjoy my visit hugely. It is the chance of a lifetime to be sent abroad on such a mission. I little dreamed a week since that I should be able to visit this beautiful country under the best conditions without giving a thought to the cost. Poor Helen! Had she delved in many volumes to obtain material that would condemn her in the eyes of the tuft hunter she was addressing, she could not have shocked so many conventions in so few words. She was poor, unknown, unfriended. Worse than these negative defects, she was positively attractive. Mrs. Vavasour almost shuddered as she thought of the sun missed at Lucerne, the son who would arrive at Maloya on the morrow, in the company of someone whom he preferred to his mother as a fellow traveller. What a pitfall she had escaped! She might have made a friend of this impossible person. Nevertheless, rendered wary by many social skirmishes, she did not declare war at once. The girl was too outspoken to be an adventuress. She must wait and watch and furbish her weapons. Helen, whose brain was nimble enough to take in some of Mrs. Vavasour's limitations, hoped that the preliminary inquiry into her caste was ended. She went into the corridor. A man made room for her with an alacrity that threatened an attempt to draw her into conversation. So she moved somewhat farther away and gave herself to thought. If this prying woman was a fair sample of the people in the hotel, it was obvious that the human element in the high Alps held a suspicious resemblance to society in Bayswater, where each street is a faction, and the clique in the terrace is not on speaking terms with the clique in the gardens. Thus far she owned to a feeling of disillusionment in many respects. Two years earlier a naturalist in the Highlands had engaged von Eulenberg to classify his collection, and Helen had gone to Inverness with the professor's family. She saw something then of the glories of Scotland, and her memories of the purple hills, the silvery lakes, the joyous burns tumbling headlong through woodland and pasture, were not dimmed by the dusty garishness of the Swiss scenery. True, Baedeker said that these pent valleys were suffocating in midsummer. She could only await in diminished confidence her first glimpse of the eternal snows. And again, the holiday-makers were not the blithesome creatures of her imagination. Some were reading, many sleeping, and the rest, for the most part, talking in strange tongues of anything but the beauties of the landscape. The Britons among them seemed to be brooding on glaciers. A party of lively Americans were playing bridge, and a scrap of gossip in English from a neighboring compartment revealed that some woman who went to a dance at Montreux wore a cheap voile, my dear, a last year's bargain, all crumpled and dirty. You never saw such a fright. These things were trivial and commonplace. A wide gap opened between them and Helen's daydreams of alpine travel. By natural sequence of ideas, she began to contrast her present loneliness with yesterday's pleasant journey, and the outcome was eminently favorable to Mark Bower. She missed him. She was quite sure, had he accompanied her from Zurich, that he would have charmed away the dull hours with amusing anecdotes. Instead of feeling rather tired and sleepy, she would now be listening to his apt expositions of the habits and customs of the places and people seen from the carriage windows. For fully five minutes her expressive mouth betrayed a little moo of disappointment. And then the train climbed a long spiral, which gave a series of delightful views of a picturesque Swiss village, exactly such a cluster of low-roofed houses as she had admired many a time in photographs of alpine scenery. An exclamation from a little boy who clapped his hands in ecstasy caused her to look through a cleft in the nearer hills. With a thrill of wonder, she discovered there, remote and solitary, all garbed in shining white, a majestic snow-capped mountain. Ah, this was the real Switzerland. Her heart throbbed, and her breath came in fluttering gasps of excitement. How mean and trivial were class distinctions in sight of nature's nobility! 
she was uplifted, inspirited, filled with a sedate happiness. She wanted to voice her gladness as the child had done. A high-pitched female voice said, "'Of course I had to call, because Jack meets her husband in the city. "'But it is an awful bore knowing such people.' "'Then the train plunged into a noisome tunnel "'and turned a complete circle in the heart of the rock, "'and when it panted into daylight again, "'the tall square tower of the village church "'had sunk more deeply into the valley. "'Far beneath two bright steel ribbons,' swallowed by a cavernous mouth that belched clouds of dense smoke, showed the strangeness of the route that led to the silent peaks. At times the rails crossed or ran by the side of a white, tree-lined track that mounted ever upward. Though she could not recall the name of the pass, Helen was aware that this was one of the fine mountain roads for which Switzerland is famous. Pedestrians, singly or in small parties, were trudging along sturdily, they seemed to be mostly German tourists, jolly, well-fed folk, nearly as many women as men, each one carrying a rucksack and alpenstock, and evidently determined to cover a set number of kilometers before night. That is the way in which I should like to see the Alps, thought Helen. I am sure they sing as they walk, and they miss nothing of the grandeur and exquisite coloring of the hills. A train is very comfortable but it certainly brings to these quiet valleys a great many people who would otherwise never come near them. The force of this trite reflection was borne in on her by a loud wrangle between the bridge players. A woman had revoked, and was quite wroth with the man who had detected her mistake. At the next stopping place Helen bought some chocolates and made a friend of the boy, a tiny Parisian, the two found amusement in searching for patches of snow on the northerly sides of the nearest hills. Once they caught a glimpse of a whole snowy range, and they shrieked so enthusiastically that the woman whose husband was also in the city glanced at them with disapproval as they interrupted a full and particular, if not true, account of the quarrel between the fierce and the limes. At last the panting engine gathered speed and rushed along a wide valley into Samaden, Celerina, and St. Moritz. Mrs. Vavasour seemed to be absorbed in a Toshness novel until the last moment, and the next sight of her vouchsafed to Helen was her departure from the terminus in solitary state in a pair horse Victoria. It savored somewhat of unkindness that she had not offered to share the roomy vehicle with one who had befriended her. "'Perhaps she was afraid that I might not pay my share of the hire,' said Helen to herself rather indignantly. But a civil hotel porter helped her to clear the custom shed rapidly, secured a comfortable carriage, advised her confidentially as to the amount that should be paid, and promised to telephone to the hotel for a suitable room. She was surprised to find how many of her fellow passengers were bound for Maloya. Some she had encountered at various stages of the journey all the way from London, while many, like Mrs. Vavasour, had joined the train in Switzerland. She remembered, too, with a quiet humor that had in it a spice of sarcasm, that her elderly acquaintance had not come from England, and had no more right to demand special accommodation at Qua than the dozens of other travelers who put in an appearance at each station after Basel. She noticed that as soon as the luggage was handed to the driver to be strapped behind each vehicle, the newcomers nearly all went to a neighboring hotel for luncheon. Being a healthy young person and endowed with a sound digestion, Helen deemed this example too good not to be followed. Then she began a two-hours drive through a valley that almost shook her allegiance to Scotland. The driver, a fine-looking old man, with massive features and curling gray hair that reminded her of Michelangelo's head of Moses, knowing the nationality of his fare, resolutely refused to speak any other language than English. He would jerk round, flourish his whip, and cry, Disaplay Samaritz Bad, Dadaplay Samaritz Dorp. Soon he announced the English Kirk, thereby meaning the round, arched English church overlooking the lake, or it might be, with a loftier sweep of the whip, Pease Julier Mountain, 
mit lex silva plana see all this helen could have told him with equal accuracy and even greater detail had she not almost learned by heart every line of baedeker on the upper engadine could she not have reproduced from memory a fairly complete map of the valley with its villages mountains and lakes clearly marked but she would not on any account repress the man's enthusiasm and her eager acceptance of his quaint information induced fresh efforts with more whip-waving peace corvatch him ver big fellow twelve thousand foots win me guide in brookzy leg she had seen that he was very lame as he hobbled about the carriage tying up her boxes so here was a real guide that explained his romantic aspect his love of the high places and he had been maimed for life by that magnificent mountain whose scarred slopes were now vividly before her eyes the bright sunlight lit lakes and hills with its glory a marvelous atmosphere made all things visible with microscopic fidelity from comfort to silva plana looked to be a ten minutes drive and from silva plana to seal maria another quarter of an hour helen had to consult her watch and force herself to admit that the horses were trotting fully seven miles an hour before she realized that distances could be so deceptive the summit of the lordly corvatch seemed to be absurdly near she judged it within the scope of an easy walk between breakfast and afternoon tea from the hotel on a tree-covered peninsula that stretched far out into lake sea maria and she wondered why any one should fall and break his leg during such a simple climb just to make sure she glanced at the guide-book and it gave her a shock when she saw the words guides necessary descent to seal practicable only for experts spend night at rose again the route followed being that from Pontresina. Then she recollected that the lovely valley she was traversing from beginning to end was itself six thousand feet above sea level, that the observatory on rugged old Ben Nevis, which she had visited when in Scotland, was metaphorically speaking two thousand feet beneath the smooth road along which she was being driven, and that the highest peak on Corvatch was still six thousand feet above her head all at once helen felt subdued the fancy seized her that the carriage was rumbling over the roof of the world in a word she was yielding to the exhilaration of high altitudes and her brain was ready to spend wild fantasies at seal maria she was brought suddenly to earth again it must not be forgotten that her driver was a samaritz man and therefore at constant feud with the men from the Cursal who brought empty carriages to Samaritz, and went back laden with the spoil that would otherwise have fallen to the share of the local livery stables. Hence he made it a point of honor to pass every Maloya-owned vehicle on the road. Six times he succeeded, but on the seventh, reversing the moral of Bruce's spider, he smashed the near hind wheel by attempting to slip between a landau and a stone post. Helen was almost thrown into the lake, and for the life of her she could not repress a scream but the danger passed as rapidly as it had risen and all that happened was that the carriage settled down lamely by the side of the road with its weight resting on one of her boxes the driver spoke no more english he bewailed his misfortune in free and fluent italian of the romanche order but he understood german and when helen demanded imperatively that he should unharness the horses and help to prop the carriage off a crumpled tin trunk that contained her best dresses he recovered his senses worked willingly and announced with a weary grin that if the gandischer fraulein would wait a little half hour he would obtain another wheel from a neighboring forge having recovered from her fright she was so touched by the poor fellow's distress that she promised readily to stand by him until repairs were effected it was a longer job than either of them anticipated the axle was slightly bent and a blacksmith had to bring clamps and a jack screw before the new wheel could be adjusted even then it had an air of uncertainty that rendered speed impossible the concluding five miles of the journey were taken at a snail's pace and helen reflected ruefully 
that it was possible to bruck the leg on the level high road as well as on the rocks of Corvatsch. Of course, she received offers of assistance in plenty. Every carriage that passed while the blacksmith was at work pulled up and placed a seat therein at her command. But she refused them all. It was not that she feared to desert her baggage, for Switzerland is proverbially honest. The unlucky driver had tried to be friendly. His fault was due to an excess of zeal, and each time she declined the proffered help, his furrowed face brightened. If she did not reach the hotel until midnight, she was determined to go there in that vehicle, and in none other. The accident threw her late, but only by some two hours. Instead of arriving at Maloya in brilliant sunshine, it was damp and chilly when she entered the hotel. A bank of mist had been carried over the summit of the pass by a south-westerly wind. Long before the carriage crawled round the last great bend in the road, the glorious panorama of lake and mountains was blotted out of sight. The horses seemed to be jogging on through a luminous cloud, so dense that naught was visible save a few yards of roadway, and the boundary wall or stone post on the left side where lay the lake. The brightness soon passed as the hurrying fog wraiths closed in on each other. It became bitterly cold, too, and it was with intense gladness that Helen finally stepped from the outer gloom into a glass haven of warmth and light that formed a species of covered-in veranda in front of the hotel. She was about to pay the driver, having added to the agreed sum half the cost of the broken wheel by way of a solatium, when another carriage drove up from the direction of St. Moritz. She fancied that the occupant, a young man whom she had never seen before, glanced at her as though he knew her. She looked again to make sure, but by that time his eyes were turned away, so he had evidently discovered his mistake. Still, he seemed to take considerable interest in her carriage, and Helen, ever ready to concede the most generous interpretation of doubtful acts, assumed that he had heard of the accident by some means, and was on the lookout for her. It would indeed have been a fortunate thing for Helen had some Swiss fairy whispered the news of her mishap in Spencer's ears during the long drive up the mist-laden valley. Then, at least, he might have spoken to her, and used the informal introduction to make her further acquaintance on the morrow. But the knowledge was withheld from him. No hint of it was even flashed through space by that wireless telegraphy which has existed between kin souls ever since men and women contrived to raise human affinities to a plane not far removed from the divine. He had small store of German, but he knew enough to be perplexed by the way in which Helen's driver expressed beautiful thanks for her gift. The man seemed to be at once grateful and downhearted. Of course the impression was of the slightest, but Spencer had been trained in reaching vital conclusions on meager evidence. He could not wait to listen to Helen's words, so he passed into the hotel, having the American habit of leaving the care of his baggage to the hall porter. He wondered why Helen was so late in arriving that he had caught her up on the very threshold of the Cursal, so to speak. He would not forget the driver's face, and if he met the man again, it might be possible to find out the cause of the delay. He himself was before time. The Federal Railway Authorities at Qua, awaking to the fact that the holiday rush was beginning, had actually dispatched a relief train to St. Moritz, when the second important train of the day turned up as full as its predecessor. At dinner, Helen and he sat at little tables in the same section of the huge dining hall. The hotel was nearly full, and it was noticeable that they were the only persons who dined alone. Indeed, the head waiter asked Spencer if he cared to join a party of men who sat together, but he declined. There was no such general gathering of women, so Helen was given no alternative, and she ate the meal in silence. She saw Mrs. Vavasour in a remote part of the salon. With her was a vacuous-looking young man who seldom spoke to her, but was continually addressing remarks to a woman at another table. "'That is the son lost at Lucerne,' she decided, finding in his face some of the physical traits 
but none of the calculating shrewdness of his mother. After a repast of many courses, Helen wandered into the great hall, found an empty chair, and longed for someone to speak to. At the first glance, everybody seemed to know everybody else. That was not really the case, of course. There were others present as neglected and solitary as Helen, but the noise and merriment of the greater number dominated the place. It resembled a social club rather than a hotel. Her chair was placed in an alley along which people had to pass who wished to reach the glass-covered veranda. She amused herself by trying to pick out the rags, the Burnham Joneses, and the de la Vares. Suddenly she was aware that Mrs. Vavasour and her son were coming that way, the son unwillingly, the mother with an air of determination. Perhaps the Lucerne episode was about to be explained. When young Vavasour's eyes fell on Helen, the boredom vanished from his face. It was quite obvious that he called his mother's attention to her and asked who she was. Helen felt that an introduction was imminent. She was glad of it. At that moment she would have chatted gaily with even a greater ninny than Georges de Courcy Vavasour. But she had not yet grasped the peculiar idiosyncrasies of a woman who was famous for snubbing those whom she considered to be undesirables. Helen looked up with a shy smile, expecting that the older woman would stop and speak. But Mrs. Vavasour gazed at her blankly, looked at the back of her chair through her body, and walked on. "'I don't know, George,' Helen heard her say. "'There are a lot of new arrivals. Some person of no importance, rather déclassé, I should imagine, by appearances. As I was telling you, the general has arranged. Taken altogether, Helen had crowded into portions of two days many new and some very unpleasant experiences. End of chapter 4